Hi, I'm Matt Damon, and welcome to Journey to Planet Earth. In this episode, we investigate serious threats to one of our most treasured natural resources. Today, grasslands are home to nearly a billion people. They're a refuge for thousands of species of plants and animals, and a sanctuary for endangered and rapidly vanishing cultures. But our program is also an adventure, an exciting journey filled with unexpected twists and turns. So please join me now as our story begins. Once, not very long ago, endless expanses of grasslands covered the earth. This was home to great herds of wild animals. Known by names such as prairie, veld, steppe, pampas, and savanna, over the years, these grasslands became a shared commons for both animals and man. Though separated by distance and culture, today these seas of grass all share a similar and uncertain future. They are under attack by a variety of environmental pressures that threaten their very existence. When viewed from above, we can clearly see why we should care about these extraordinary oceans of green. Home to over 800 million people, grasslands cover more than 30% of our planet's landmass. We begin our journey here, along the windswept prairies of northeastern China, in the autonomous region of Inner Mongolia. There are few places on Earth as remote and isolated. Yet the treeless steppes of Asia have sustained nomadic herders and horsemen for thousands of years. These are the proud descendants of Genghis Khan and his tribe of celebrated warriors. 800 years ago, they ruled a vast empire stretching from the Pacific Ocean to the Mediterranean. Inner Mongolia was also part of the legendary Silk Road, once the only link between Asia and Europe. Desert caravans also brought new cultures and nearly half a dozen major religions. Today, the Silk Road traders and the Mongol warriors are long gone. But their spiritual and cultural legacies remain. Ancient Buddhist temples are still sanctuaries for the faithful. And 400-year-old mosques still beckon the devout. During the summer months, thousands gather at a series of grassland festivals. Opening ceremonies are elaborate cultural celebrations. But ultimately, the major focus of attention is the horse. Praised in song and depicted in folk dance, the horse has always been central to Mongol culture. It's a passion that extends into the world of art. Hu Dar is one of China's most popular artists. During grassland festivals, he is often invited to demonstrate his craft. His specialty is horses. With just a few simple brush strokes, Hu Dar captures the animal's elegance. grace and poetry of its motion. 
Inner Mongolia's love affair with the horse begins at childhood and never seems to end. In this and so many other ways, the grasslands of Inner Mongolia are dominated by the cultural rhythms of the past and by the ebb and flow of the seasons. Here on the steppes of Asia, the summers are hot and often without rain. The winters are long and cold. These are the ideal conditions for sustaining one of the largest grassland ecosystems in the world. Less rain, and there would be desert. More, and there would be forest. By early June, the winter settlement of Hubei is nearly deserted. This is a small hamlet of 25 herding families, about 200 people. Like thousands of other villages throughout the steppes, during the summer months, Hubei is a virtual ghost town. Its residents have moved on to the grasslands, living in gears, small mobile tents made of felt and canvas stretched over wooden frames. The herders will stay in a location as long as there is enough grass and water. When the pastures and ponds have been exhausted, families will move on about four or five times during the summer. There are no fences out here. The grasslands are a shared commons. And like pastoralists all over the world, they depend on the grazing patterns of their neighbor's animals to keep the ecosystem healthy. It has always been this way. But recently, a cherished way of life is in jeopardy. And the threat is coming from places far from the grasslands of Inner Mongolia. Shanghai is the perfect example of the new China. This once unassuming fishing village is now a modern riverside metropolis. the commercial and financial center of China, and perhaps all of Asia. Today, many of its 15 million residents enjoy a newfound wealth, and China has become a country of consumers. Food markets overflow with fresh produce and once unimaginable luxuries like milk, eggs, and meat. Yet not very long ago, these food stalls were empty. The year was 1962. Angry protesters disrupted the country. A series of misguided political decisions brought agricultural production to a halt. Famine claimed a staggering 30 million lives. Today, the nightmare of extreme hunger is long gone. In fact, China accounts for a quarter of the world's consumption of meat. Though the abundance of food is a testimonial to China's economic boom, it has also contributed to severe environmental pressures. To exploit the growing demand for meat, herders have increased their cattle, sheep and goats from 100 million head to over 400 million. However, there's not nearly enough pasture to support the increase in livestock. And extreme overgrazing has created a crisis. When grasslands become so overgrazed and they lose their plant cover, they're very difficult to restore again. There's really just too many animals out on the grasslands. And it's going to be necessary to to stock animals at what the land can support. Cattle are suffering, and without the protective cover of grass, 
nearly 73 million acres are in danger of turning into wasteland. In the spring, seasonal winds often spawn massive sandstorms. Three hundred miles to the east, these storms often paint China's capital a haunting yellow. For days, thick dust covers Beijing's horizon. Traffic becomes a nightmare. The stifling air causes respiratory problems and severe discomfort. Though controlling grassland degradation is difficult, there are ways to ease the problem. Huya has always lived on the grasslands. She and her husband, Sahem, are from a long line of herders. It's the only life they and their 22-year-old daughter, Shuju, know. Though their lifestyle may seem modest, until recently, the family was doing quite well. They own 250 sheep, worth about $15,000. In a nearby pasture, their son is rounding up half the family's flock. They will be sold at the local market. Because of a recent drought, there won't be enough hay to last the winter. Though the family will lose money on the transaction, in a sense, it could be a blessing in disguise. By reducing the number of sheep, their overgrazed pastures may have a chance to regenerate. But today, Sahem is coping with a more personal problem. He is preparing a special farewell dinner to honor his daughter. She has recently decided to seek work in a distant city. This is a dilemma for the Mongolians because on one hand they want to try to maintain some of their traditional culture, but yet they are lured to the cities and the better life that that has. But you lose the indigenous knowledge that the herders have about the weather, about the ecology of the grasslands, and about their animals. So this is something that each individual family is struggling with. This is the first time a member of their family will leave the grasslands. It's a decision Shuju's parents find hard to accept. Huya fears that her children are losing many of the traditions passed down from generation to generation. For Shuju, it's a chance to enjoy some of the luxuries of China's expanding economy. Her destination is Hailar, a city of over 200,000. Once a quiet agricultural village, it has become a modern industrial center in Inner Mongolia. Employment and educational opportunities are luring millions away from the countryside. And it's rapidly changing the face of the grasslands. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. In the evening, cultural change becomes more obvious. Even older generations are embracing a more contemporary, though slower paced, existence. But for those still living on the grasslands, the struggle between old and new has never been greater. Shuju's farewell dinner is clearly not a happy occasion. It's particularly difficult for a family that has always treasured the traditions of their nomadic heritage. 
though most will agree that economic prosperity will make the lives of future generations easier. Clearly overgrazing and the loss of culture are taking a toll. It's a problem challenging people all over the world. Kumbewa is a small fishing village along the shores of Africa's Lake Victoria. These waters, shared by Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, are so big, the lake is virtually an inland sea. Not very long ago, Lake Victoria provided a livelihood for 10 million people. But now it's home to an exploding population of over 30 million. Here in Kenya, most live in extreme poverty. The average income is less than $400 a year. The burdens of overpopulation have also brought extreme ecological problems. Lake Victoria is surrounded by grasslands. Silt, coming from overgrazed and severely eroded savannas, is slowly choking these once fertile waters. Local fishermen are experiencing drastic declines in their catch. Many species are endangered. Some have already disappeared. A computer visualization of Lake Victoria shows a major source of the pollution. Shown in green and red, gigantic plumes of silt pour into the lake from Kenya's Nyando River. The grasslands surrounding the river are scarred by a network of severely eroded gullies. They are being studied by an international team of soil scientists. The gully that you see here today is not something that occurred over a geological time scale, um, but it's something that's very, very recent and, and man-made. The area that we're standing in now, 30 to 60 years ago, was part of an extensive grassland savanna ecosystem that stretches from here down into the Serengeti um, plains in Tanzania. Over the last 30 or so years, this area has become very much degraded due to human encroachment. This irrigation pipe once ran along the ground. Today, it's suspended nearly 50 feet above a badly damaged landscape. This whole lake plain is primed for a major catastrophe if we get another major rainfall event like occurred in the 1960s here, where you have massive downpours, and this whole area will carve up and wash into the lake and cause huge sedimentation problems with uh, massive fish kills. Okay, we do an upslope now. Enhanced satellite pictures reinforce the team's research. The red indicates healthy grassland. The blue-gray denotes eroded areas that have lost most of their vegetation. The devastation covers over a third of the Nyando River Basin. Only a hundred miles from Lake Victoria, a part of the basin's ecosystem has already collapsed. Six of seven local rivers have dried up, victims of a water-dependent and soaring population. A major casualty is nearby Lake Baringo, a treasure of biodiversity in the middle of Kenya's Great Rift Valley. This is a refuge to hundreds of species of birds, a habitat for more than 20,000 migrating waterfowl each year. Yet its scenic beauty belies a harsh reality. Lake Baringo is dying. It's literally drying up. I was born and raised here in Lake Baringo. And the area that we're now standing on used to at one time be lake. Um, in fact, uh, there would have been about seven or eight feet of water here. 
Murray Roberts feels a strong bond to this place and its people. Over the years, they have watched with dismay as their jewel of a lake turns brown, as it slowly loses volume. The lake is receiving about four million cubic meters of silt every year. And as the years go by, the lake goes further and further down, and the bottom of the lake comes further up. And the long-term prediction is that it will eventually become a swamp. Murray knows the reasons all too well. Increased agriculture has siphoned river water away from Baringo. Overgrazing has led to massive amounts of soil erosion and silting. For now, at least, the birds still flock to Lake Baringo. But only a few miles away, there are no birds. And a once fertile grassland ecosystem has turned into a sea of dust. Paul Parcelak's life revolves around caring for his livestock. Every morning, his cattle and goats are let out to graze. And every evening, he and his wife check their herd for ticks and thorns as they return. For as long as Paul can remember, the family's days have been defined by the herd's search for grass. When I was young, that's 30 years ago, the land was uh, not as degraded as it is now. There was a lot of vegetation, there was a lot of grass, but at the moment it is difficult because all the grass is gone and the, the land is not enough for everybody and their livestock. Paul is caught between two worlds. He and his Njem tribe once lived a nomadic life. Now they live in permanent villages. This gives their children a chance to attend local schools, the opportunity to become modern Kenyans. But every time Paul Parcelak crosses his ancestral territory, he is reminded of the conflicting pressures of the 21st century. As his people became more sedentary, their livestock stripped away the grass. Not long ago, Paul realized that time was running out for his family and for the Njem tribe. That's when he sought help from Murray Roberts. After years of watching Lake Baringo slowly disappear, Murray started the Rehabilitation of Arid Environments Trust, dedicated to reclaiming the local grasslands. We're looking at a, a situation where about 82% of the um, area of Kenya is semi-arid, and very much of that area has become overgrazed and denuded. Now, using the, the techniques that we have developed here, a lot of that area can be rehabilitated and become useful again. Only indigenous grasses are used, hardy native species, which bind eroded soils together and start the process of grassland regeneration. Murray's rehabilitation project shows great promise. It has already reclaimed almost 5,000 acres of once denuded landscape. His effort not only helps restore the savanna, it provides jobs. These sheaves of Aristida grass are being harvested and taken to a local market for sale as thatching and fodder. The collection of grass seed for land rehabilitation has become a new source of income for the women of Paul's household. It's brought glimmers of hope to a situation which seemed so desperate. With the togetherness of the family, with our reclaimed land, we will make a living. The family is going to have a, a good future. The restoration of the savanna is good not only for humans, but for all the species that thrived in this once lush environment. Like the weaver birds, who now have enough grass to build their nests. 
It's also a heartening reminder that there are ways to restore the fragile ecological balance of the grasslands without losing the region's cultural identity. The lesson of Lake Victoria and Baringo is simple. The semi-arid grasslands and the surrounding rivers and lakes are all interdependent ecosystems. What happens to one affects the others. It's an important lesson especially for those living nearly 1,800 miles away in a remote part of South Africa. Wackerstrom is a small village of 6,000 people. Most days it's quiet, except on those occasions when the silence is broken by the prayers of a spirit medium. Lizzie Nguenya is a Sangoma a traditional healer of the Zulu people. She is communicating with her ancestral spirits, asking for guidance to treat a patient suffering from asthma. At the end of the session, she prescribes an herbal remedy that often provides a measure of relief. Two or three times a week, Lizzie searches the neighboring hillside. Like the other 20,000 traditional healers in South Africa, she is always searching for plants that have healing qualities. For centuries, Wackerstrom has provided Sangomas like Lizzie and Gwenya with nearly a thousand different medicinal herbs and plants. This valley, sits in the middle of one of the most unspoiled grassland ecosystems in the world, the High Veld. South Africa's central highlands are an environmental treasure. This may be the oldest grassland habitat on the planet, so ancient that it existed before the Earth's original landmass broke up into continents over a hundred million years ago. Here, the word grassland is almost a misnomer. Only one in six plants are actually grasses. During the spring and summer months, over 800 species of wild flowers carpet the landscape, turning it into a delicate mosaic of pastels. The grasslands also act like a giant sponge, a natural reservoir that soaks up water during the rainy season and slowly releases it during South Africa's long dry season. These wetlands are home to some 360 species of birds. a sanctuary for migrating flocks from North Africa and Europe. These highland pastures provide fertile and abundant grazing for animals, both wild and domestic. Overgrazing and erosion have never been a problem. Until recently, this was an ecosystem in almost perfect balance. Today, it represents a microcosm of a global debate. How best to balance badly needed economic development with the preservation of nature. These beautiful grasslands are one of the oldest landscapes in Africa, around about 180 million years. They used to cover as much as 60% of Africa, and today they're being threatened by all sorts of things. Perhaps the most invasive are alien tree plantations to feed great big paper and pulp mills for Japan and the US. Not very far from Wackerstrom, hundreds of thousands of acres of grassland have been turned into tree plantations. Logging has become a major industry in South Africa. Mm -hmm. 
These trees being harvested, mostly pine and eucalyptus, are not native to South Africa, and they are beginning to take over parts of the veld. They consume nearly 40% of any available rainwater, water that is necessary to maintain the delicate ecological balance of the grasslands. But the timber industry also provides jobs, and South Africa is desperately poor. Alan Robertson owns a local lumber mill. He knows how serious the situation is. It's vitally important that what we're doing here is, 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 is first and foremost giving us a living. We employ a, a number of 52 people that work two shifts a day. Just, I think, an indication of where we're at in terms of the economics and the desperate need of folk in our province. Some of the men actually said, you don't know how hungry we are. We have folk who are dying of AIDS in the, in the, uh, in the villages, and uh, we've come to look for work, and we desperately need food. The timber industry is at the center of an environmental dilemma. Rural South Africa's unemployment rate is nearly 60%, and the industry employs over 135,000 people. While no one questions that the country needs jobs, economic development is slowly destroying the grasslands. Here in South Africa, as in Inner Mongolia, it's still too soon to say how widespread the damage will be. However, there are places in the world where the consequences are dramatically apparent. Until a few years ago, Argentina was the world's eighth richest country. The capital, Buenos Aires, is a sophisticated slice of the old world. It vies in elegance with Paris, Madrid, and London. But recently, for its 12 million residents, a robust way of life turned violent. Rioters protested as Argentina's banking system suddenly collapsed. Life savings vanished overnight, and a seemingly prosperous economy was replaced by poverty and anger. But as Argentina continues to suffer from economic uncertainty, there is one industry that still gives the appearance of prosperity. Only a few miles from the center of Buenos Aires is one of the largest livestock markets in the world. Almost 15,000 head of cattle are bought and sold in a day, well over two million every year. Ranching in Argentina is not just big business. It's the heart and soul of the nation. Much of Argentina is a vast prairie of fertile soil. An ocean of grass extending from the Atlantic coast to the snow-capped Andes. Here in the shadow of 14,000 foot peaks is the Argentine state of Patagonia. Shaped by the never-ending winds that roll off the eastern slope of the Andes, this is a place famed for its desolation and rugged beauty. Most of Patagonia was once a region of nomadic Indians. They are almost all gone now driven from the land or massacred during the early days of colonization. All that remain are a few ancient cave paintings. Very little to remind Argentina of its indigenous past. Patagonia's extreme isolation attracted a colorful crew of outsiders. Near this remote railroad station, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid hold up for a few years. 
The American outlaws bought a 12,000 acre ranch. Four years later, they returned to crime. Driven out, they say, by the harsh Patagonian climate. But most of Patagonia's immigrants were honest, hard-working sheep farmers. They came here because the terrain was perfect for raising sheep. Several times a year, the herdsmen on the El Manantial ranch round up their livestock. The herding takes several weeks because in Patagonia, thousands of acres of grazing land are needed to support even a modest sized flock. After the sheep are driven into corrals, they are separated. Some are designated for market, others for shearing. The average sheep will yield about 10 pounds of wool. Once, this was a thriving industry. Today, it's a business that's struggling. Falling prices, a weak economy, and competition from synthetic fibers are problems. But environmental degradation is the most serious. And it's slowly destroying the wool industry. 70 years ago, Patagonia's prairie supported 20 million sheep. Today, it can barely support 8 million animals. Overgrazing has stripped the land of grass, leaving the topsoil vulnerable to wind erosion. An astonishing 80% of Patagonia is in danger of turning into a desert. But the most fertile part of the Pampas is in central and eastern Argentina. The weather here is constant, mild and moist, not nearly as harsh as in Patagonia, perfect for raising cattle. The Pampas of Argentina have a long and romantic history. Much of it revolves around an almost mythical character the gaucho. His freedom and bravado, celebrated in many poems and songs, once represented the spirit of Argentina's open range. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the grasslands of Argentina were dominated by vast estates. The owners of those ranches saw themselves as South America's rural aristocracy, country squires with a lavish lifestyle. The gauchos were the cowhands of those estates. Independent and proud, they rode the open range herding cattle. With his wandering lifestyle and fierce coat of honor, the gaucho was also the symbol of an earthy nobility. Today, this is a way of life that's almost completely disappeared. Oscar Bumade owns a small but successful ranch with about 60 head of cattle. He has little need for gauchos, but he is a lover of the silver daggers and decorations, which were symbols of gaucho honor. Oscar's wealth enables him to pay a price for a collection no gaucho could ever have afforded. Today, traditional gaucho ornaments are still made by silversmiths like Juan Jose Draghi. Juan Jose's workshop is legendary in Argentina for the precision and beauty of its work. His sons have all studied with master craftsmen in Italy. The pieces they create fetch exorbitant prices. The dagger Oscar Bumade is buying will cost him $2,500. 
This is an extravagance fewer and fewer can afford. Economic realities have forced the gracious old estates to become efficient enterprises. Hector Turoba has been a rancher for over 50 years. Over time, he has witnessed enormous change. Natural cycles are now hurried along by science, and gauchos no longer ride the range. They are more likely to be found injecting cattle with hormones. This ensures that all the cows calve at the same time. Though the cattle industry continues to grow, the recent economic crisis makes it hard for ranchers to resist making even higher profits from intensive farming. Crop production is the greatest threat to the Pampas. Lured by rising prices for produce, farmers now control 30% of the grasslands. Once converted to cropland, the Pampas will never come back. But farming also brings other problems. Argentina is forced to increase agricultural productivity, so we will have to pay special attention of problems like contamination, for example, because we are increasingly using more fertilizers, more pesticides. Without the grasslands to absorb the water, during the rainy season, the Pampas has become vulnerable to flooding. Even worse, the water is tainted by agricultural chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticides. Suddenly, rivers and aquifers are at risk. Though much of the Pampas still remains intact, for those that are still deeply attached to the land, for those that still earn a living riding the open plains of Argentina, any further loss of the grasslands could be devastating. And no country in the world has experienced a greater loss of this treasured ecosystem than the United States. It's July 4th, Independence Day. Nobody seems to celebrate it with quite the enthusiasm as the people of Cimarron, New Mexico. This is the heartland of the American West, home to many of the dreams and hopes that built the nation. Cimarron is also a place that still celebrates the traditional skills of the American cowboy. These are the children and grandchildren of early pioneers, the thousands of settlers that forged a life from a vast, unspoiled wilderness. The nearby ruins of Fort Union are a reminder of those early days. 150 years ago, this was the West's biggest military outpost. The fort played a key role in shaping the destiny of the Southwest. It kept guard over this part of the Santa Fe Trail and the thousands of settlers heading for the fertile prairies of the Great Plains. They came by wagon train and what they found was astonishing. 400 million acres of shimmering grassland that stretch from the Missouri River to the Rockies, from Texas to Canada. It supported 30 million buffalo and vast herds of deer, antelope, and elk. It was an ecosystem that seemed inexhaustible. It wasn't. The destruction of the North American grasslands proceeded with a speed and intensity unparalleled in history. Gone are the vast herds of animals that roamed the plains. 
gone are the thousands of species of plants and flowers that blanketed the prairie. And gone are 400 million acres of open rangeland. In the end, 80% of North America's grasslands were plowed under, permanently destroyed to make way for endless rows of wheat, corn, and soybeans. It didn't take long, less than a hundred years. Today, the Great Plains feed a nation. It's become a breadbasket for the world. But at what price? Like the Pampas of Argentina and the Veld of South Africa, the prairies have become the domain of big business. Most small farmers have given up. Unable to compete, they left behind quiet reminders that mechanization means fewer people are needed to farm larger tracts of land. 100 years ago, farmers were nearly 35% of the American population. Today, less than 2% of American families work the land. Rural villages like Springer, New Mexico, are on the verge of becoming ghost towns. The signs on their boarded up shops are sad reminders of a once thriving farm and ranching community. Fortunately, there are those who are dedicated to preserving what's left of a fragile ecosystem. The Gray Ranch is in the southern part of New Mexico. It's become a laboratory for studying old and new ways of sustainable ranching. A unique partnership between traditional cowboys and rangeland ecologists. The herd is carefully managed. It's never allowed to exceed the grazing capacity of the land. In the spring, the cattle are rounded up. This is the time of year when calves are separated from the herd, branded and vaccinated. Here at the Gray Ranch, they use more traditional methods of working the cattle. For the younger generation, it's a learning experience that's meant to be passed on to future ranchers. We've got 502 square miles here. It's not pristine, but all the pieces are there. All the systems are still functioning. Uh, this not only means that we have uh, an incredible array of biodiversity, but it also means that we can use natural processes to do much of our management here on the ranch. Controlled burning is perhaps the most important grassland management technique used at the ranch. If a fire starts during a lightning storm, it's allowed to burn. More often, it's ignited by fire management experts. Grassland fires regenerate the land. They clear away dead growth and invading trees and shrubs. Though the blades of grass are consumed as well, the root systems are undamaged by the fire. The fire we're doing here today is really part of a long-term ecological research study that looks at the interaction of fire with grazing. And fire is really important in arid grasslands, and really any grassland, because it increases the uh, nutritional value of the grasses, which is good for both uh, the cattle, but also native species such as antelope. It goes together. You have a healthy wildlife habitat, it's going to be good for your agricultural interests. What we're doing here is trying to maintain and and manage open country for open country and that keeps your wildlife corridors open and your habitat healthy and that benefits your livestock too. But for the people that work at the Gray Ranch, it's not just about saving the grasslands, it's about preserving a way of life. 
Okay, Tom, we're going to try this thing. Whenever possible, they join together as a community. A barn dance has always been a celebration of the values that are a part of the American West. It's a heartening twist of fate that the people of the Gray Ranch, whose ancestors may have played a role in the devastation of the prairie, are today its staunchest defenders. Their deeply held respect for the land speaks volumes to people living on the grasslands all over the world. It speaks directly to the herders of Inner Mongolia who are developing ways to cope with an expanding desert. It has much to say to Paul Parsalak and all those struggling to break the cycle of poverty and land degradation. It gives hope to the people of South Africa who are recognizing that there are no easy answers or quick solutions. And it encourages the people of the Pampas to continue their battle against the loss of a precious resource. In the end, if the grasslands of the world are to survive, it will be because of the efforts of people everywhere. All those who are willing to find ways to strike the right balance between what we want and what nature can provide. Though separated by distance and culture, for the 800 million people who work the land, for those who draw sustenance from the grasslands of the world, there are common bonds. Bonds that are renewed by each generation, bringing new ideas, new attitudes, new hope. Planet Earth, this is our home. This is where our journey of discovery must begin.